to the end. This is the last lecture for the final exam. And per usual this semester, it's going up much later than I had planned on. Um, best laid plans of mice and men, I guess. I was thinking about cutting it um, because it's late, but it might be the most important lecture of the entire semester because it is going to be the most applicable and the most important knowledge for all of you to know regardless of what you do when you graduate because it's on climate change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence for climate change um, so you know that you're armed with that knowledge if you ever encounter a climate change denier in your life. Um, and then we're going to talk about how climate change affects ecology, which I'm particularly interested in because I do a very small bit of that work on bumblebees. I haven't published any of it yet. But uh, yeah, so that's what we'll talk about today. I did get dolled up for our Last lecture, I am wearing some wildflowers because we're going to talk about the effects of climate change on wildflowers. And, you know, we're going to be talking about melting tundra regions. So I wore my drippy barrette from Chunks, which is a barrette company. I love it. Um, so let's do it. Let's talk about climate change. Pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew, pew. pew. To start off this lecture on climate change, I thought I'd show you a really nice infographic that I found on Twitter, I think last year. Um, there's a lot of really good climate change researchers on the internet that are making really awesome infographics to make the um, overwhelming data in support of human-mediated climate change um, to make it a little more digestible and understandable to the general public. And this is just one of them. This is from this guy on Twitter. Um, and this is looking at changes in temperature by month um, since the pre-industrial time. So this is oldest history, most recent. Uh, and you can see for every single month, especially for March, temperatures have been increasing since pre-industrial times. So let's let's talk first about the mechanism. So most of the things in this beginning part of the lecture that I'm going to talk about I got from uh, the climate website for NASA. Tons of really great info. NASA has done an excellent job in um, summarizing the evidence for climate change and making these awesome infographics for explaining it. So um, if you ever find yourself trying teaching someone about climate change, go to the NASA website. It's awesome. I'm trying to think if anyone else in class wants to be a teacher besides Maddie, but I guess it's just for Maddie mostly. Um, so let's re let's go all the way back to the beginning of the semester and revisit the greenhouse effect. So, um, well, let's wait until this gift starts over. Okay, start over gift. Okay, so sunlight hits the earth. Some of that energy is absorbed, but some of it is reflected back into space. Um, some of it is radiated as heat, but then there are gases in our atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide, which is a natural gas, that trap that heat and that ra solar radiation, and that causes warming around the Earth. Um, with increased solar radiation, you have more trapping of that heat. So if you think about the... Um, net radiation map from the beginning of the semester, you have higher net radiation around the equator because of its distance to the sun. Um, so this is what it looks like naturally. Uh, you've got CO2, some methane, uh, nitrogen, other greenhouse gases up here that are trapping some of that solar radiation and radiating it back to Earth. Um, what we have done with our actions is that we have added um, more greenhouse gases, per, more carbon dioxide, particularly more methane, um, into the atmosphere that increases that gaseous layer and so that more radiated heat is trapped and emitted back to Earth, increasing the surface temperature of the Earth. So the greenhouse effect is a natural effect that already exists, but we have enhanced it with adding carbon emissions into the atmosphere. 
Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the mechanism. You might encounter some people that just say that the sun is getting hotter. Uh, that is not true. This is some data looking at um, solar irradiance versus temperature. So this is the solar activity of the sun over time. It is increasing a little bit, right? Um, but not very much. Now if you compare that to surface temperature, so this is an increase in solar irradiance, so the actual radiation coming from the sun, this is the increase in temperature. You do not see, a pair, there's a much higher increase in temperature, particularly you see this huge spike starting around 1960 because of us. Uh, a huge increase in temperature that doesn't correspond with an increase in solar radiation. So the sun is not getting hotter. We are making the Earth's temperature surface hotter by adding carbon emissions to the air. We have done that. Um, you might also see some arguments that this is a uh, part of uh, temperature cycling and um, and carbon dioxide cycling in the environment. And what we're seeing is just a fluctuation you would see over thousands and millions of years. Um, that is also not true. Uh, here is a graph of carbon dioxide levels, parts per million over geologic time. Now. You may be asking yourself, hopefully you know the answer, how do we know what carbon dioxide levels were this far back in history? Well, we get that from our ice core data, so digging deep, deep down into permafrost and deep layers of the, the earth to areas that have, been, have not been exposed for that period of time and looking at uh, radioactive decay in those. Um, we also get it from tree rings, so there's lots of fossilized trees. We can tell how tr fast a tree was growing and therefore the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment based on those tree rings. Also, we can look at carbon, uh, historical carbon dioxide levels from ocean sediments, coral reefs, lots of independent fossilized uh, ancient data sets that we can use to estimate these carbon dioxide levels. So it's not just ice cores, it's not just tree rings, it's all of these things together that go into estimating historical carbon dioxide levels. So you do see periodic fluctuation, big, large, large fluctuation in carbon dioxide levels, but they never went above this line until 1950. So there is a dramatic increase in carbon dioxide because of us that has never been seen historically for over decades to millennia before. Um, because of this data, there is a greater than 95% probability Given all, you know, if you do a meta-analysis of all the data for human-mediated climate change, there's a 95% probability that current warming is a result of human activity. Um, and current warming is occurring at roughly 10 times faster than the average rate of Ice Age recovery warming. So not only are carbon dioxide levels higher than they have been in millennia, uh, so is the rate of warming, which again, we get from these historical ancient data sets. Again, this is all stuff from uh, the NASA website, which is a really great resource. Now let's talk about the scientific consensus. You might hear people say that there is not a scientific consensus on whether or not climate change is being caused by humans. That is also not true. Uh, this GIF right here, which is also from NASA, uh, is showing um, climate data collected by five completely independent institutes studying atmospheric sciences uh, and all of them have nearly identical projections of the average global temperature anomalies increasing over time. Uh, so one is from NOAA which is a federally funded U.S. agency, one is from Japan, I don't know where the Hadley Center is, uh, Berkeley Earth is a separate U.S. In institution, and then, of course, NASA, two separate government-funded institutions, Berkeley, uh, one from a, another country. This is probably also from another country. There is very high scientific consensus on whether or not the Earth is warming and whether or not we were, are responsible for it. And the Earth has warmed dramatically over the past century. So this is a figure from your textbook looking at um, temperature surface anomalies over time. So it's 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s. So um, 
this anything in the red increase it shows an increase in surface temperature anomalies anything at the purple is a decrease and you can see globally there are large increases in temperature anomalies year by year and we'll talk about like climate change isn't just an increase in temperature but it's also an increase in anomalous temperatures over time so irregular patterns from what we've seen in the past uh, and you can see them particularly uh, anomalous temperature patterns up here in Arctic regions. So over the past century, the Earth has warmed by about 0 0.7 to 0.4 degrees Celsius. You will see why 0 0.74 degrees Celsius is a really big change in the effect it has on animals later in this lecture. The rate of warming is greater than at any other time during the last thousand years. Um, oh, and the change, the anomalies that you're seeing here in this graph were calculated as the difference between the current year mean surface temperature for the base period of 1951 to 1990. So it's comparing it to that base. Um, and then the value that's recorded in the upper right corner of each of these graphs, each map, is the global average temperature range for that decade. So global average temperature range for the 70s was zero. <laughs> And now it's 0.51. That's huge temperature anomalies are happening all over the world by the 2000s. The greatest warming that we have seen, as you can also see in these graphs, is has occurred in the Arctic. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the Earth. It has the greatest warming during the winter months. So uh, the freeze free periods in mid high latitude areas are lengthening. So when I talk to you about doing field work in the Arctic where it's sunlight 24 hours a day and you only have about three months of summer uh, slash spring, that period has been getting longer because of this uh, increased warming in the Arctic. There's a 10% decrease in snow cover and ice since the 1960s. Uh, the ocean has been absorbing more than 80% of the heat added to the climate since the 1960s but um oh and then ocean warming has caused seawater to expand because of the melting of ice and then sea levels have risen in response to the ocean warming um so while the ocean is warming and absorbing 80 percent of the heat it is warming slower than you see on land um think for a second back to like the second lecture of this class about why the ocean may be warming slower than land. I'll give you one second. Do, 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 do. Oh, did you say because water has a high specific heat and it takes a lot of energy to warm it up compared to gas? Well, then you would be right. Water has a high specific heat. So that physical property of water explains why the ocean is warming slower than land but it is warming and it's taking most of that heat that's added to the climate system. Um, let's talk a little bit about these graphs that are here from your textbook. So uh, graph A is a change in northern hemisphere spring snow cover. You can see uh, there are huge fluctuations in snow cover, um, but it is decreasing over time. Um, graph B is Arctic summer sea ice extent, huge declines in Arctic summer sea ice extent, uh, and then these different lines represent different independent data sources that are measuring um, the extent of sea ice. This, this gap in this blue line is probably just because they weren't able to collect data for that period. Maybe they lost their federal funding or something. I don't know why. And then these are probably some new institutes that started in the 80s that started recording summer sea ice. So this is multiple independent data sources measuring sea, su summer sea ice extent, and it's dramatically decreased, which is why I'm wearing that melting barrette. Uh, this one is looking at the global average heat content of upper ocean waters, and you can see that they started recording, multiple different institutions started recording data for this in the 1950s, and that it has dramatically increased that heat content um, and then this is the global level sea level change 
dramatic increase in sea level change over time as well. Uh, so let's talk about how climate change is affecting the organisms that live on this planet. Um, one way is that it Climate change has a direct influence on the physiology and development of organisms. So um, there's been a, a recent decrease in average body size for a lot of endothermic am animal species that is correlated with increasing temperatures. So think back to, again to the animal adaptations lectures and some of the things we talked about with trade-offs and constraints in adaptation and why uh, endotherms which regulate their body temperature might be decreasing in average body size with increasing temperatures. Think about that for a second while you look at these pretty pictures. Oh, did you say because it's energetically expensive to be large? Well, then you would be right. Um, mass specific metabolic rate tends to decrease uh, with increasing body size. So, Smaller body size is more energetically efficient under a warmer climate. Um, you, your metabolic rate actually decreases um, with an increasing body size because you're growing larger, that mass-specific metabolic rate. So it's actually slower the bigger you are. Um, so it's actually more energy efficient in a warmer climate to be smaller. Um, yeah. Um, and then this is uh, an article I found from the Natural History Museum. You might be wondering, how do they know that animals are getting smaller? Well, we have fossils and bones. Uh, and not even fossils, just bones of things from pre-industrial revolution. We can tell that these larger animals are getting smaller. These larger endotherms are getting smaller because of fossils and bones. Like my bone collection, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, let's talk about some other metabolic impacts on physiology uh, with climate change. Um, this is actually a picture, so this is a, a graph from your textbook, or it might actually be from the original paper. I can't remember if it's from your textbook or from the original paper. Um, but this is in your textbook, and the guy who's the lead author on this paper, Michael Dillon, also studies phys bumblebee physiology, and here he is at a conference I went to last year around this time, presenting the data from your textbook uh, on like a seminar on uh, the physiology and conservation of bumblebees. So I just threw that in there to sh show you he's a real person <laughs> that works on bees. Um, and also the metabolism of lots of other organisms. So let's look at these global changes in metabolic rates. So this first graph is looking at changes in mean temperature. You can see, as we already showed before, Arctic areas are dramatically increasing in mean temperature, or their changes in mean temperature over time. The south temperate and tropical regions are not changing as much in temperature. Um, but if you look at these predicted changes in uh, metabolic rates across a variety of different ectotherms, you actually see greater predicted changes in metabolic rates for ectotherms that live in tropical and north temperate regions and not so much in the Arctic and south temperate, um, at least for this graph here. And then what else you see is, um, this is another graph I think from that same paper by Michael Dillon, is that there are predicted changes in metabolic rates of uh, ectotherms so this is just the, the, the change in temperature across the globe, greater temperature increase here, as we already know. Um, but you see bigger changes in metabolic rates, not in the Arctic where you see the greatest temperature, but particularly in reptiles and invertebrates closer to the equator. Um, why might that be? Why are we seeing bigger metabolic shifts uh, in metabolic pressures on organisms nearer at the equator when the largest changes in temperature are occurring at higher latitudes in the Arctic? Why might we see this inverse relationship between metabolic stress and change in temperature? Hmm.
I wonder if we're going to talk about it on this slide. <laughs> um, tropical ectotherms, in particular, particularly things like reptiles that live in desert regions or in tropical regions, um, they may be particularly vulnerable to climate warming, even though observed and pre predicted tropical warning is relatively small because they're already limit, living at their thermal tolerance limits already. Arctic organisms are not living at their temperature, maybe at the cold end, but not at the heat it, heating end, which is probably going to cause more death, especially for ectotherms, to live at the maximum temperatures of which you are uh, metabolically capable of surviving. Um, so in this graph, this is looking at uh, comparing multiple different species of crabs at different latitudes and looking at what their maximal habitat temperature was. So let's say for this one population of crabs in Chile, their, the maximum habitat temperature, which they got, you know, by recording the average temperature at that site over like a year or something, they found it was about, what, 28-ish, 27, 28-ish was the maximum habitat temperature. And then what they did is they did physiological experiments to determine the LT50 of these crabs, so uh, all these different species of crabs from different localities. Basically, they saw how, men, how high a temperature they could heat them to, and 50% of the population would die. So, not, not very nice to the crabs, but important information to know. And so the LT50, the lethal temperature for this population of crabs was about 32. So they're living at like 20, 25, 28, but their lethal temperature is just a few degrees higher than that already, right? But now let's look at these populations in, uh, that are closer to the equator. So these populations in Chile and in California, they're not really already living at their temperature maximums um, because they're farther away from the equator. Now let's look at these sites where they looked at crab species that were much closer to the equator in Panama in the North Gulf of California. Uh, let's just say this one, for instance. The maximum habitat temperature is about, what is it, like 42.5? And then the LT50 for these crabs is like already 41. So they're like a degree away from hitting cook them to death temperatures. So that's why you see greater metabolic stress with climate change on organisms living in the climate and they might tropical optotherms may be more threatened by climate change than species from like mid latitudes or the arctic because these tropical species are already living to their upper closer to their upper to temperature tolerance limits and um, in some cases, they are actually living above their physiological optima, like these populations here are already being close to being cooked to death. So um, that's why tropical ectotherms are more vulnerable to climate warming, even though the warming in the tropics is relatively small. Now let's talk about, that was all about aminals, let's talk about plants. Um, in mesic region, regions in eastern North America, so like where we are, um, ecologists have studied uh, effects of climate change on the physiology of trees by looking at tree rings, which we talked about before. Again, this is also um, from the NASA website that explains how what kind of information you can get from tree rings. Um, and what they found is that tree rings are larger over the past century. So, you know, trees can live to be hundreds and in the case of bristlecone pines, thousands of years old. And what they found is that these tree rings from the last past century are much wider because they have increased growth rates. And those also correlate to an increase in the length of the growing season. They have more time to grow. And so they have increased growth rates over their growing season. Um, and so those rings are much larger than they are on the inside when the tree was like, you know, only 50 years old or something. So that's for Eastern North America. Let's talk about what's going on in the West Coast of the United States. Um, there are 
increasing water deficits associated with warming. So while trees are growing faster over on the east coast, on the western coast, climate change is compounded with uh, drought conditions. Uh, climate change has made droughts very long uh, and very harsh on the west coast of the United States. And so what you're seeing over on the west coast is increased tree mortality with increase with climate change. Um, the red dots on this graph are show increasing mortality rates for trees. So you see increased mortality rates in almost all these populations, except for the few that are blue, where you see decreasing mortality rates. But for the most part, these populations have increased mortality rates over time. Um, and then this is just a look at by region. You see, um, it looked like there was already pretty high mortality rate in California, but it's only increased since then. Same for the Pacific Northwest and the interior. It's increased dramatically in the Pacific Northwest, tree mortality. And then this is by species. Um, ab I don't know how to pronounce that genus. Abias? These are fir trees. <laughs> fir trees have dramatic inclines in increased mortality, and so have pine trees. Um, Pinus is the genus. Dramatic increases. Um, tsuga or hemlock trees, which are particularly threatened by drought in the west coast and by uh, hemlock adelgid, <laughs> which is an invasive pest here uh, in the east, eastern part of the U.S. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what else is compounding with drought to affect tree mortality here specifically later on. Now in the tropics, now if we look at um, how climate change is affecting the physiology of rainforests in Costa Rica, uh, researchers have found a decrease in growth rate of rainforest trees. Um, that's associated with increasing minimum daily temperatures. So we have talked about before how some species that live in tropical regions, um, they may already be at their photosynthetic maximum capabilities based on the net radiation that they're getting. And so if you increase the temperature, um, photosynthesis is also tied to temperature as well as net radiation. So if these plants, again, are already operating at their temperature maximums and you increase above that, you might start causing photo in, um, photo inhibition where you see decreases or photo inhibition and photorespiration where you see decreases in photosynthetic rates because they have uh, gone outside of their temperature and net radiation bounds. Um, so, yeah, decreased growth rates as results of higher rates of respiration, photorespiration. Um, I didn't have a good picture for this, so I just threw up some uh, pictures from when I was in Costa Oh, my gosh, this is a decade ago. That's a little baby me at 22, 23 uh, in Costa Rica when I went there for a conservation genetics course. And again, that's that strangler fig. I think I showed that to you last time. I still have that tank top in that hat. Lost those glasses in the ocean on the last day of the trip. It sucked. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about how climate warming has also altered the phenology of plant and animal species. So this is the seasonal patterns of growth and reproduction in animals and plants. Um, yeah, so phenology, as a reminder, is the timing of seasonal activities of plants and animals. We've covered that before. Um, and because of climate change, spring activities have occurred progressively earlier since the 1960s. So this is data on Parus major, the great tit. It's a bird in the UK. And the mean egg laying date of females has advanced by about 14 days since the 1970s. This is a 47 year population study of Parus major. Um, really long term ecological study like the one I'm hoping to do at St. Vincent that you guys are the second class to participate in. So, um, yeah, this is a long-term ecological study. That's where this data came from. So, um, oh, this is the, the warmth sum. So of that region, increase in temperature, mean laying date has uh, gone from here all the way to here. So they're laying almost two weeks earlier than they would uh, a few years, a couple decades previously, and then the mean laying date, you see it go down to. Um, here's a study on European migratory birds. Um, 
This study showed that arrival date and breeding grounds has advanced in response to increasing temperature trends in their overwintering sites. So where they are spending um, their winters, they have um, showed advanced um, arrival in their breeding grounds from those overwintering sites over time. Um, so you can see a pretty clear trend here. Um, now let's talk about how climate warming has altered the phenology of plant and animal species. Uh, the data that's presented to you here is um, from a study of flowering plants in Canada. Um, it was a 70-year study period looking um, at blooming phenology of, plant, of uh, flowering plants in, in Alberta, Canada. Um, and what they found is that... Um, the mean minimum and the mean maximum temperatures for these regions have increased over time, over this 70 year period. So this is the minimum temperature of that site over time. And you can see the line, the slope here, it's increased month for the mean monthly temperature for April, March, and February, which is when spring begins, has increased over time so has the maximum temperature and in response the plants have changed their flowering periods as well so for late flowering plants they only advanced by zero to six days there's not much change in the ones that flower later in the season like maybe towards the end of april into may but for early blooming species um, particularly this anemone species, and then one of my favorite all-time trees, this is the anemone, um, quaking aspens, they have um, advanced an average of two weeks over a seven-day day period. So climate warming has really affected when early blooming flowers have bloomed. And if you think about that, and you think about the pollinators of these plants, which I'm always thinking about, uh, that can have drastic consequences for bees that are coming out of wintering in a slightly starved period. They've used up all their reserves from hibernation, and they need to find food fast. If those late flowering plants uh, aren't out when they need them, um, or they bloom too early and the bees aren't coming out at the same time, you might see a mismatch between the plants and their pollinators that they need for reproduction. Um, I love quaking aspens. I tried to find a gif of them like blowing in the wind, which is why they're called quaking aspens. The leaves kind of like quiver. I just, oh, I just think they're so beautiful. I saw them for the first time in the Rocky Mountains and I just like was mes mesmerized. This picture really doesn't capture how beautiful they are. Um, and then these are some of the late blooming flowers. This is yarrow, which I have in my backyard. This is choke cherry, which is native to this area. And then this is uh, silverberry, the elagnus. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's talk a little more about phenology in animal species and plant species. Um, this data here, these data here show that um, amphibians are in trouble. They have advanced twice as fast uh, in their spring timing days um, than trees, birds, and butterflies. Um, not true for some bird species, but you see advances in their arrival out of hibernation or out of estivation or whatever is advancing a lot and much more so for some groups of organisms than others, which is related to their physiology, right? Um, Butterflies actually have a three times greater advancement in arriving out of spring than early flowering plants, like I said before. So the butterflies are coming out earlier than the plants that they feed on and they pollinate, and so they can starve to death if they don't have adequate nutrition from their mutualistic flowers in the environment. So dramatic effects on plant-insect interactions because of climate change. Climate change has also made animals move. Um... In many cases of different organisms, the northern boundary of a species' ge geographic distribution 
is going to reflect constraints that are imposed by the minimum temperature requirement. So it's colder up there, and where they are at the upper boundaries is usually dictated by uh, the minimum temperature that they reach in those. So with an increase in temperature over time because of climate change, the minimum temperatures at higher latitudes and higher elevations uh, get shifted towards poles or higher elevations. So uh, this is a study that came out, oh dang, I edited out the year. It must have been last year if I put it in here. It was either last year or the year before looking at uh, uh, large rain lo range losses and shifts in bumblebee species. Um, and you can see that species have been gained in northern regions because of that increasing minimum temperature, um, but species have been lost. So that you're, there's, you're seeing a northward a northward movement of uh, multiple bumblebee species over time. Oh, and then, oh, this is a, a range of multiple species. This is a projection of uh, species that are to be lost. So it's a model based on current, what we understand currently about movement of bumblebee populations over time from historical data. Um, more on cha changing geographic distributions of species due to climate change. Uh, European non-migratory butterflies, look at that pretty, pretty butterfly. 65% um, of 52 species that were studied had extended northward in the past three, 30 to 100 years. They've extended northward because of that shifting, increasing minimum temperature. In this graph here, uh, this is looking at birds in northern hemispheres of the earth. Um, a lot of bird species have seen northward range expansion since the 1960s. Um, not included on this, but uh, eastern U.S. trees. 54 to 92 percent of species in the eastern U.S. of trees have shown range contraction in the north and the south. So not just in their southern limits, but also in their northern um, in the Arctic, many, uh, there's been observed many northern expansions of shrub species into the tundra. As you know, because of the limited sunlight and limited, uh, or the lower minimum temperature and maximum temperature, um, some, you typically don't see shrubs in tundra ecosystems, uh, some species are expanding. And then you're also seeing, we talked also about how any tree species that grow in tundra regions tend to be a little short, stumpy guys, and they can be very old, but they tend to not grow very high. Uh, researchers are also seeing um, increases in tree height growth along with the increase in temperature, which increases their photosynthetic capabilities um, in southern parts of the tundra where temperatures are increasing. Um, in numerous, numerous studies, particularly uh, at the Rocky Mountain Biological Labs, have shown shifts in the elevational boundaries of plant species in montane regions because as the climate warms, those high mountain regions, which might have not been suitable because they were too cold in the past, are now getting warmer, and so species are moving up the mountains. Um, climate change can also affect species interactions and how species interact with each other. Um, Particularly, it might create a mismatch between the herbivores and the food that they feed on. Um, in Greenland, for instance, the plant growing season has advanced 14.8 days. That's over two weeks. But the calving of caribou has only advanced by a day and a half. And so there's been increased calf mortality over time because the calf are starving to death because the plants are blooming and gone. Um, by the time the caribou are calving. Uh, in Lake Washington, um, spring phyto phytoplankton blooms have advanced 27 days, uh, and only uh, rotifers that feed on those phytoplankton have advanced with them, not other things like not herbivorous daphnia, and so other rotifers have been able to keep up with the bloom in the phytoplankton that they feed on other uh, zooplankton have not and will probably starve to death and see increased mortality. Um, so that corresponds to long-term decline in Daphnia populations. Um, now let's talk about the mountain pine beetle. This is that artwork I have hanging up in my house that I bought from a friend uh, who's an artist that lives in Sonora, which is a town outside of Yosemite. Uh, 
I think he even plays on a baseball team called the Bark Beetles. Um, they are devastating pine forests, and partly they are able to devastate pine forests because of climate. Um, mountain pine beetle epidemics have increased as a result of many climate-related changes in pine trees. So drought has led to increase, decreased tree health. The trees aren't nearly as healthy. That increases their susceptibility to the beetles. Um because they aren't as healthy, so they can have larger infestations. The warming has led to expansion of pine beetles into higher elevation forests, like I talked about previously, because of the increasing temperatures at higher elevations. And then due to warming, um, their flight season begins more than one month earlier and is twice as long. Uh, and some populations have actually evolved two generations per year instead of one because of how long their flight season is now. Like, they now reproduce twice as many beetles in a season than they used to previously. And you just can't... You can imagine the kind of impact that that's going to have on an herbivore if suddenly uh, the... the Or, sorry, it's going to have on a plant species if their herbivore has now doubled in population size over time. It's going to decimate them, right? Um, oh, one other thing that uh, your, your textbook talks about is in the Arctic, um, red fox ranges have been expanding northward with increasing temperature and are actually starting to outcompete Arctic fox populations um, because they've been able to move into those areas. And so you're seeing increased uh, competition between species as other ones expand their range. Um, you can also see changes in regional diversity. Uh, so we're thinking about like ecosystem level or landscape or community level changes now, uh, and how communities are responding to climate change. Um, this graph here is a graph of the mean annual temperature and mean annual rainfall in Tucson, Arizona, which is nearby the Santa Catalina mountains. Uh, you can see increase in mean annual temperature since the fifties, but a decrease in um, mean annual rainfall. Um, along with that, you also see uh, shifts in the plant communities um, and their seasonality based on elevation in mountain regions that corresponds to this change in mean annual temperature. So um, in Santa Catalina Mountains, 75% of the species uh, sh si shifted significantly upslope or they now grow in a narrow elevation compared to 1963. Um, so the white bars in this graph are the elevation range data. So this is just going out and doing plant quadrat surveys just like you did for lab um, to determine their elevation extent and their distribution. So the white bars are what the distribution was 1963. The black bars are what the distribution is now. You can see uh, this lotus species has shifted upward in elevation. Um, this one's become more restricted at higher elevations. This pine species, uh, I'm guessing it's sort of kind of like a hemlock based on the genus name. Um, here's some oak species. This one's become really retracted in range. Um, so has this, these two oak species. Oh, all three of these oak, four oak species have all become restricted in range. Um, Oh, I know what that one is. That's a manzanita species, Archistaphylos. Uh, that's like one of my favorite plants. Um, that one's moved up in elevation into areas it wasn't previously. So this is community-wide changes in species distributions due to climate change. Um, let's talk a little more about shifting um, patterns in the ocean. We haven't talked much about the ocean yet. Um, in the eastern North Atlantic Ocean, um, there are large-scale changes in species composition and diversity of copepods. We talked about how important copepods are in marine ecosystems and uh, particularly for nutrient cycling in those areas. They have huge bi uh, biomass contributions to ecosystems in, in the ocean. Um, but over the last 40 years in the Eastern North Atlantic, there have been northerly movement of warm water plankton by 10 degrees latitude, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, 
You also see similar movement of cold water plankton northward, um, and it's more pronounced than in terrestrial organisms, which likely has to do with ocean currents. Um, so these are uh, warm, temperate species of copepods. This is what they were previously. This is what they are now. They've expanded northward, expanded northward, uh, expanded northward, although also contracted at the same time. Um, this one greatly expanded northward. Um, so you can imagine because of their importance in the food webs in marine ecosystems and because of just the sheer amount that they contribute to the biomass in the, or in the environment, they are, copepods are reliant on those photosynthetic plankton. So their, their feeding on those phytoplankton is going to maybe cause algal blooms in the ocean because they're not there to eat them. Um, if you think about the predators that then feed on the copepods, they may be limited and you might see increased mortality because they're starving, because they've moved out of those regions, or they may shift and move with them, right? Um, you can have this kind of response to climate change could have dramatic cascading effects on marine communities. Now let's talk about the effects of climate change at like a global level, which is the last hierarchical level of ecology that we covered for this class. Um, this is looking at that net primary productivity, which we talked about in the last lecture. Um, so this is a change in NPP over time from eight, 1982 to 1999. And then this is over the decade after that. Um, you can see huge NPP changes here compared to here that likely has to do with rainforest deforestation. Um, that's why you're seeing this huge change in NPP. Um, oh, and I'm not sure I covered this, but you might be wondering like, how do you measure global NPP values, net primary productivity? Um, these are all um, satellite-based measures of photosynthetically active radiation in the atmosphere around each of these positions. And satellites measure these across the globe daily, monthly, yearly, and then that data is then used by ecologists to study ecosystem processes. Um, yeah, NPP has increased by 8% globally um, from 1982-1999. Yeah, and like I said, the Amazon rainforest accounted for 42% of the global increase in NPP um, because there's decreased cloud cover and increased solar radiation. Um, and then... NPP actually decreased um, from 2000 to 2009 due to uh, regional drying. So you see an increase in NPP during this time period, but then because of that increase in solar radiation, it also caused drought. And then because of that drying, you then see a period a, a period of drying globally because drying, drying, um, because there's a lack of water availability which we talked about is tied to NPP. So, um, if we continue to increase the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases that we are emitting into the atmosphere, it is predicted with strong, robust models that it will get worse. Uh, in this graph, these are the mean changes in surface air temperature and precipitation under a scenario of rising atmospheric concentrations of gases developed by the IPCC, which we will talk about in just a second because it's very important. Um, at current rates of emission, if we don't do anything, CO2 in the atmosphere will double pre-industrial levels during this century. Um, but CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas uh, increasing. There are is methane, chlorofluorocarbons, hydrogenated chlorofluorocarbons, nitrous oxide. Um, methane comes mostly from uh, agriculture uh, and cattle farming. Um, some of these gases, which weren't in the atmosphere before, actually trap more heat than CO2. So it's not just increases in CO2, but new gases that trap heat more effectively. Um, and the models that are being used to predict the future, 
because uh, I think it's important that you understand where this information is coming from and where all these dire warnings from scientists are coming from. They're not just making them <laughs> making them up. They're based on data in predictive models that are based on historical data. Um, so general circulation models are computer models of Earth's climate system that can simulate probable future climate scenarios at different spatial scales and you can input as a parameter in the model what if we decrease our carbon emissions by this what if we do nothing what if we uh decrease our emissions to this and so you can uh change that parameter within the modeling to then see where we might be in the future if we take action now or if we do nothing so these models are really important for helping us um, decide policy and what we need to do right now to make sure that that climate change doesn't get worse in the future. Um, all of these general circulation models um, predict an increase in average global temperature and global precipitation just at higher rates if we do nothing. Um, so let's talk about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change who issued a report with these uh, figures in it. So they're the group that's doing these circulation models and trying to um, use these robust models built on a foundation of very strong historical data to decide what the policies need to be to make climate change less of an impact in the future, or at least slow it down. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the UN body for assessing the science related to climate change. It was established by the United Nations Environment Program, uh, the World Meteorological Organization, in 1988. So, as you also saw in Spaceship Earth documentary, we have known climate change is happening for a long time. This organization was founded in 1988, the year after I was born, to provide policymakers with regular scientific assessments concerning climate change. So this is the connection between the scientific evidence and the policymakers. Uh, its implications and potential future risks, as well as the, the point of this uh, panel is to put forward adaptation and mitigation strategies, and it has 195 um, member states slash countries. Um, in the 2013 report, um, there's increase in globally average surface temperature in the range uh, of one, it could be one degree if we act now and we take dramatic measures to slow the sp to slow climate change. It could be up to six degrees Celsius by the year 2100 if we do nothing. And I have already showed you the effect that that will have on plants and animals earlier in this lecture. They expect the greatest warming to be in winter months. I can literally look outside my window and see that right now. Uh, and at northern latitudes. There's also going to be not only increased greater warming, but also increased variability of climate. So we talked about those temperature anomalies, more storms, more, storms, more hurricanes, uh, more snowfall, which you have all witnessed in your lifetime. Um, and you might be wondering, well, how do we know this is really what's going to happen? How robust are these models that are trying to predict the future and what we should do to mitigate climate change? Uh, well, we know now because we've known about climate change for a while and there have been predictive models from early on about knowing about it. And now is the present and we can see whether or not those models held up. Um, those climate forecasts were pretty much basically on target. So these are the models uh, that were developed, I think, in like the, the 80s and the 90s of what might be predicted to happen in the future. Um, and the blue line is the actual observational data. So except for a few years, uh, well, except, so these are, oh, and then these are different agencies that had different climate forecasts. Um, 17 different climate models from the 1970s. And you can see for the most part, most of these models 
uh, were very, very close to what we actually ended up observing. So these models are very robust. They're built on large foundations of historical data, and we already have tested them, and they have shown to have high predictive capabilities. So what, how do ecologists um, study and predict e how ecological systems might respond to climate change? Uh, one project that I wanted to mention uh, to you all, because I've been there, is the International Tundra Experiment. It's um, 13 countries, so this is where it is. 13 countries across 11 sites, and I've been to, actually, all three of those sites. I've been to all three of those sites. Um, and at these areas, they've been respond measuring the response of tundra plants to increase temperature. Um, at these sites, they've been doing experiments where they increase the plant level temperature air temp by one to three degrees Celsius, which is in the range of predicted and absorb warming for tundra regions. So they've created like small scenarios that have increased the surface temperature to mimic what might happen in the future. Um, and they found responses detected in whole plant communities after only two growing seasons to this increase in temperature. Um, and they found that the warming actually increased the height and the cover of deciduous shrubs and grasses in tundra regions. Um, it decreased the cover of lichens and mosses, so it seems like succession is happening faster when you increase that temperature if you're losing those early successional species like lichens and mosses, and then decreased species diversity and evenness overall because of these simulated areas with increased temperature. Um, oh, this is a picture at, uh, oh, I think number one is, I could just flip through my textbook, but I'm not going to make you wait, and I don't feel like editing this video. I think number one is Tulik Field Station. This is, uh, these are the camps, the tents that you stay in at that field station, and then this is our crew when we were staying there, the Bombas Polaris, and then this is one of the boardwalks that heads to, um, I think that heads out to the sauna that people usually um, use for R and R at Tulik Field Station up in the Arctic Circle. Um, this is one of the sites where they've been doing these experiments, these climate si simulations. Let's talk a little bit about climate modeling, since it's an it's an important tool that ecologists use for predicting ecological responses to climate change. There are two major sources of uncertainty in climate modeling. Uh, number one is uncertainty from the limitations in our understandings of processes that control the current distribution and abundance of species. So there's some uncertainty because we don't know everything about what controls current distribution and species abundance. We can know a lot for some species. We may know a little for others. There's also uncertainty associated with specific predictions of how the climate in a given region will respond. So we've tested these models now over time because we've known about climate change for some time and we know that they are robust but there is going to be some uncertainty about what will actually happen in the future. We can't predict with 100% certainty what the future will hold and how a region will respond to elevated greenhouse gases. Um, there are two main types of studies that ecologists do to study the impacts of future climate change. One is they examine the response of ecological systems to experimental warming. So they'll do experimental warming in a lab scenario or out in the field like they do at Tulik. Maddie Kornman, hi Maddie, is actually doing this for her senior research project. We increased temperatures and we also grew them with decreased water availability, both which are predictions of and have been seen in climate change scenarios. So we basically tested the effect of climate change on squash plants for Maddie's research project. So you can do experimental warming uh, and other factors that also might change with increased warming. So you can do an experiment in a closed system, or you can use models of ecological systems to evaluate the response to future climate scenarios. So let's say you do a, there's great, well, I don't know, uh, what's a good animal? We have a lot of good physiological data for. I don't know, pick like a fish species. Maybe there's really great uh, physiological data on the 
physiological constraints and limits on fish metabolism or fish development, fish feeding. And then you input all of that data into uh, a model, an ecological model, and then you change temperature within as a parameter in that model, and you, then you use that to predict how a species might respond to future climate change scenarios. So using a mathematical model. It's important that you remember this part because if you look at the study guide that I put online, I am telling you right now what I am going to ask you as one of the final exam essay questions. It's going to be worth about 15 points, so it's going to be a huge part, and I want you to design an experiment where you will examine, you will study the ecology of an organism and the effects of climate change on it at any hierarchical level below the landscape level. So I want you to design a individual level or a population level or a community level experiment, you know, with any your favorite organism, whatever you want to do, your favorite type of community. I want you to design an experiment and design it well because it's worth 15 points for the final exam. I am happy for you to like write it up what you want to answer for that and then I will read it and tell you if how many points you will get for that answer on the exam. I love like I'm happy to proofread. This isn't like I'm not trying to trick you. So um, and if you have trouble thinking of an experiment, let me know too, and we can work on one together for you to put on the final. Um, a lot of you have actually already done this for your GRFPs, so you could even use what you wrote for your GRFPs, but it's important that you have an explicit hypothesis, you have um, a control and an experimental variable in your experimental design, and it's also important that you have some predictions that are based on previous knowledge of what you know about that organism. So you need a hypothesis, a control, an experimental variable. Uh, you need, obviously, details for how long your experiment's going to go for, what you would measure, and then you also need um, predictions on what you think will happen. That's five things. So hypothesis, control, experimental variable, explicit variables that you will measure and quantify and how you'll quantify them. And then, uh, you know, I, it doesn't have to be like an extremely long essay, but I'm telling you right now it will be a question on the exam and it'll be worth a lot of points. <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to prove for you before the exam. Anyway, that's why we're talking about the two types of studies um, of e ecological systems and how they are impacted by climate change. Um, one group that's been studying... Uh, ecology and climate change for a while is the Network of Ecosystem Warning Studies, um, and they've been doing experimental warming for two to nine years, um, and they found that it increased soil respiration rates by 20%, net nitrogen mineralization by 46 and NPP by 19 So what this group has found by increasing, by doing experimental warming is that decomposition and nutrient cycling is happening a lot faster at warmer temperatures, which if you think about everything we talked about with nutrient cycling, could be really bad. <laughs> Especially if that soil decomposes so fast that plants can't hold their structure in it anymore. Um, you can also use ecological niche modeling and bioclimatic envelope modeling to predict how a species might change its distribution in the future. So there are future climatic models um, that you can use to predict how a species might move in its range and distribution in the future. Um, this is a, an ecological niche modeling of um, a fly that vectors leishmaniasis, which is a terrible disease that infects people. And you can see uh, this is the current distribution under three different types of model um, modeling algorithms. And then this is what they predict for 50 years in the future in terms of the uh, geographic distribution of that disease-carrying fly. Um, with 
almost all of the models, besides the BioClim model, you see an increase in the range. Actually, you even see it in an increase in range with the BioClim model too, just not in certain regions. Um, you see an increase in the range of this fly that transmits diseases. Um, so climate warming, climate change has an effect on people too because it can increase the spread of disease vectors. Um, this is just some more recent reports. Um, this is a video that talks about the Paris Climate Agreement and um, the last, oh, maybe they've had one since then. <laughs> oh, I should have updated this. This is the uh, a, news art, a news video um, talking about why the Paris Climate uh, Accord is really important. Um, this is an article from the New York Times from two years ago that talks about cascading health risks to human populations because of climate change. So extreme heat could cause increased human mortality. You can have lost labor because of increased temperatures, um, because maybe forestry jobs are lost or crops are lost. Increased infectious diseases, which we'll talk about in a second. Droughts and floods, which will cause mortality. And then also um, food production might be affected by climate change. This is a graph that's showing um, deaths attributable to anthropogenic climate change between 1970 and 2000. Uh, so each land mass is scaled up to the size of how many deaths it's had because of climate change. We have not had many, but we've been contributing a lot of atmospheric carbon emissions to the atmosphere. Um, a lot of regions in Africa have not been committing have not been emitting a lot of carbon emissions, but they are seeing the most deaths uh, because of climate change. So there's a huge um, inequality in the polluters and who is actually being uh, killed by anthropogenic climate change. So you may have seen oh, this no. top 21 popping up. Okay, I have to edit that out. Um, and because we're in the middle of a pandemic, I thought I'd talk about the effects of climate change on infectious diseases. Um, climate change will bring more infectious diseases, and it already has. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Um, if we're thinking specifically about arthropod-borne diseases, uh, mosquitoes are very sensitive to weather partly because they breed in stagnant pools of water. Climate change affects, affects the weather, which then makes it easier for mosquitoes to transmit malaria and yellow fever. And a lot of people don't know that there's this link between climate change and infectious diseases. Uh, this is a study that just came out recently. That was like, what, two days ago? Um... There's also this article that came out at the beginning of the pandemic, um, which I remember mostly because of this graphic that went along with it. Uh, it shows that visual communication is really important. Um, connected to that and climate change is that protecting and conserving habitat can help us mitigate climate change. Um, but it can also help us, help us from getting another pandemic. Um, part of the reason that we have seen more an increase in infectious diseases and new zoonotic diseases is because we have an increased, we've destroyed habitat for a lot of wildlife that increases their interactions with humans. You increase the interaction of wildlife with humans, they're more likely to spread new emerging diseases to humans. Um, so protecting wildlife is great for stopping diseases and it's great for helping mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, this is an, ar an article that recently just came out in Nature that was looking at um, why deforestation and the extinction of species make pandemics more likely. Um, and I just thought I'd put this up there. This is something that we've known for a really, really long time, this link between uh, infectious diseases, um, climate change, and habitat conservation. Um, 
but we're only now really becoming acutely aware of it because we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. So, um, that brings us to the end of this lecture on the ecology of climate change. So, that's the end. Um, I wanted to just put a little message at the end here. First to say thank you for um, putting up with me this semester. This is, I tried a completely new and very foreign teaching format for me. Um, so there were lots of bumps and unexpected uh, things happened throughout the semester and you all were so patient with me um, and like, I thank you so, so much for being so patient with me um, trying to figure out how to teach this class without also getting you sick. And hopefully it was entertaining and I hope you'll learn something. Um, and I also wanted to leave a final message just to let you all know how very, very proud I am of all of you for weathering the storm for putting up with isolation and quarantines and fears of getting infected. Um, you should be very, very proud of yourselves for everything that you have been able to accomplish this semester. I am very, very, very proud of you all. Um, I think a lot about how someday in the future you all will have nieces or grandkids who are going to have some like class report where they're going to have to interview somebody who was alive during the pandemic and you're going to tell them all about what it was like to be in college during the pandemic um and you'll be able to tell them that you succeeded and that you you made it through um and that your at least one of your professors was very very proud of you for doing that um, I hope to see you all again next semester. I'm going to be teaching mostly online, but if I'm around on campus, you're free to come visit me in my office as long as you got a mask on. And then maybe one day when we have, we're all vaccinated, we can all give each other a big hug and have a big party to celebrate surviving. So that's my send off. Um, for the semester. I hope you really take this time, this break that we have coming up to rest and to celebrate life and yourself and your health. Um, and I, I really do. I love you all so very much. Um, okay. Bye-bye.